Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Now, today's session is going to be a little bit different than usual. This is a pre-recorded session because currently I am in the Amazon rainforest in Peru. So hopefully I'll have lots of cool content uh, to share with you in future world's most exciting classrooms. But as you can imagine, the connectivity uh, in the rainforest is not able to let me join you and host the event. So I pulled together a little bit of content in advance. Uh, you can check out with your classrooms. Uh, this content will focus on Peru because that is currently where the Uster Scale Day is right now in uh, Callao. We have our Darwin leaders in the field right now, which is amazing. They're going to have great new conservation projects to work with. They will have amazing footage uh, and conservation learning to share with us as well in future world most exciting classroom events. Okay, so our speaker joining us today is an amazing Peruvian chemical biologist. She's a National Geographic explorer, educator, conservationist, and award-winning artist. Her name is Rosa Vasquez Espinoza. So she founded the project Micro Amazon that explores the microscopic universe of extreme environments and unique animals in the Amazon rainforest. And she's doing this to look for new molecules and new enzymes that might be helpful in green chemistry and medicine. She's also been exploring a region known as the Boiling River, which is a roughly four mile stretch of water flowing through Peru's rainforest. It can reach as high as 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That means if you're an animal that falls in, you are toast, you are cooked, you are boiled. The river has long been the stuff of legend. It was even dismissed by many in Peru as a non-existent river. So she's been documenting what extreme creatures can live uh, in and around these dangerous waters as well. So let's do it. Let's jump into the recorded event and let's meet Rosa. Thank you so much, everyone, for making the time to be here with us today. I am always deeply excited to talk with classrooms uh, because I think really that's where a lot of the inspiration came to me personally for the work that I do today. So I'll guide you a little bit more about um, to learn more about my own story and background, how I became a National Geographic explorer and a scientist, and a bit more on the current work we are doing. I'm actually heading to the Amazon rainforest in just a few days for my next expedition. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, give me just one second here. And is that okay, Joe? Can everybody see it? Looks good, Rosa. Lovely. So my path, it's a little bit unconventional and I'm very excited to share it with you. And my work as a doctor in chemical biology focuses on amplifying hidden worlds within the Amazon jungle. Typically, when we think about the Amazon rainforest, you may think about such a remote and exotic place filled with dangerous anacondas and perhaps flesh-eating flowers and all these larger biodiversity organisms that are beautiful and exotic and important to know about. But so often we miss on these smaller worlds that are equally important to maintain the ecosystem of the Amazon rainforest and to even understand it fully. And those are the worlds that I like to focus on through science as well as through storytelling. And the reason why I became interested to begin with in this topic, I really think it's because of my origins, my family and the classrooms that I was a part of. I grew up in Peru, so I'm Peruvian. That's currently where I am right now, visiting my family and getting ready for the next expedition. And my family came from different parts of the country. Some came from the Andes, the high mountains. Some came from the jungle, some came from the city. Uh, so I was raised amongst these different environments. I went to school in the city and I would spend the summers in the Andes helping harvest potatoes or spend some summers traversing through the Amazon River in these small boats known as Peque Peque, as you can see in the in the photo there. The, they get their name of Peque Peque because of the, the sound they make while they are moving the little motor and going through the water like Peque Peque. So um, to me, that you used to feel like a Disneyland experience. It just felt like unlimited playtime to really unleash creativity. And little did I know that Looking back now, 
that connection that I had constantly with nature really inspired a lot of the questions that I had while growing up. How do plants work? How do nature work? And I do have to attribute a lot of that to my grandmother, who was a traditional healer in her community in the Andes. There had, they had very limited access to Western medicine, hospitals, and even medical doctors. And so she and a few other elderly people in the community took it upon themselves to be the ones that transfer some of the knowledge they had received from previous generations, from their grandparents, and et cetera, uh, to be able to provide some cures for when people were feeling sick. And all of these knowledges, my grandma took from the mountains to the city whenever they moved back uh, where I grew up. And so she developed a small natural pharmacy in our backyard where I was raised. So every day after school, I would spend the whole afternoon with my grandmother and I would just follow her around everywhere. I was just literally behind her every single step, telling her everything I thought about, asking her all the questions I had. And amongst those, um, I was just very curious as to how is it possible that plants have some sort of medicinal power? To me, that just sounded like magic. And she used to prepare her herbal medicines around me and show me a little bit. But because she never had the chance to go to school, um, she told me, well, I know the empirical aspect. I know the cultural context. However, for you to understand the actual biology and chemistry, you go become a doctor and learn about it and then tell me. And so that's what I did. At the time, there were not many opportunities um, to study science in Peru. So, so I applied to the U.S., and before I continue a bit more on my story, I do want to pause to give this really cool example that I think, I think even further exemplifies what made me so excited to join this field on natural products and nature. And it's an example I learned in school um, through one of our textbooks from the Pacific U tree. So in around 1950s, 1960s, the United States made a call to try to find new ways to cure cancer. They had been working very hard on the laboratory to try to look for new synth synthetic solutions, new medicines that they could be building to try to tackle more difficult cancers to treat. Um, however, they were really not getting the results that they were looking for. So then they thought, hmm, could we go back to nature and try to get some of the solutions there? And so they made a giant call and they partnered with the Department of Agriculture to be able to go and look for natural species, plants, animals, sediments, to try to find anything that may give them a clue to develop a new medicine for cancer. And after a lot of search, I think they searched over 800 natural species, they found this tree, Pacific U tree, that has this blood-like dark red resin color in the bark. And after studying the different chemical components and genetic components of this bark, they learned that there was one key molecule known as taxol that could help kill cancer cells. And thus, by adding a few more years of research and studies, they were able to develop a medicine that is still used to date to treat different type of tumor forming cancers. So they were able to go back to nature, look for a solution, apply a lot of science in between in order to be able to find a solution for humans in a more sustainable way as well. And so I would be learning this type of class, uh, this type of stories in, in the classroom. And so I was fascinated to dive a, deep, be, de, a bit uh, deeper in what my grandmother was telling me at the time. So then that kind of triggered some questions in my mind as to what are the type of chemistry that are in the plants in my own backyard. And through trips that I took to the Amazon jungle at the time with school, I started to continue asking the same questions. What do we know at this almost invisible microscopic genetic chemical level of the Amazon jungle? And I realized that there were some things that were known, but a lot more that weren't. And I think it really depends on how we ask questions, which is something that I really try to emphasize with classrooms. Uh, you don't need to know it all. And sometimes we think that everything's been discovered, but we just need to look into new spaces, whether it's our own backyard or somewhere more remote, like the Amazon jungle. So with that, I decided to pursue a career in science, specifically in an area that is known as chemical biology. So I pursue an undergrad in biology and chemistry. And then 
um, decided to pursue a five-year PhD in, at the University of Michigan in chemical biology to be able to learn how to conduct this type of investigation in the laboratory, how these type of things work. Uh, and in that process, uh, I became a National Geographic Explorer as I had a deep interest in connecting all my scientific work with conservation-driven actions, as well as with, uh, with being able to tell stories from the field, which is what I get to do now. And in all of these talks so far, I haven't told you so that I actually started um, as an artist. So I used to be fascinated by the wor our world, still am. And I became a professional dancer for a few years. I was really deeply into folkloric and in cultural dances, did some competitions and teaching. And I like to highlight that because I think we often forget that when we go deep into a topic, we think, oh, if you have any other hobbies, then you're going to get distracted or your work is not going to be as impactful um, as it could be. But I tend to disagree with that because I think the different curiosities that we have and that we get to explore, especially as kids and as we grow up, are really what end up, ends up making us unique and approaching our work in a unique way. And by being able to dedicate some of my time and my passion to dance, that really made me think very creatively about the work that I want to do. And I apply this type of visual and movement creation into the storytelling projects that I I create and use to communicate the science that I do. And so today I'll tell you two very brief stories, uh, one on Amazonian stingless bees and one on a river that quite literally boils in the Amazon rainforest. And first I'm going to play this video. <laughs> So I'm not crazy. These are actual stingless bees. So they really do not sting. They can bite, but they do not sting. And you may have heard of them before. You may have not. But they actually exist all around the world, specifically around the tropics on our planet. Uh, they can be found in Central America. They can be found in Africa, all around where you have these tropical jungles, typically. And in the Amazon, they have been there for centuries. We even found reports that a long time ago, before the Spanish came to explore South America, stingless bees and their uses were already being, uh, they, they were already known by Amazonian indigenous communities uh, for a very long time. And what kind of uses are these? We know that bees are really helpful with pollination. In fact, it is because of bees around the world that we are able to eat. Two out of three foods that you eat depend quite literally on bees, which is why you may have heard projects about save the bees around. However, there's some information that hasn't been shared, which is save what kind of bees, because that really does make a difference. And stingless bees have been kind of left aside not just by the, the area where I work, which is the Peruvian Amazon, but really all around the world in terms of their legal protection, in terms of their recognition, and et cetera. Many reasons as to why that happens. One of them being that compared to the stinging bee, the one that we are all familiarized with, with the stinging bee tends to produce a large amount of honey per beehive, about 40 to 50 kilograms or liters of honey. Meanwhile, stingless bees tend to produce much less, about four to five only per beehive. However, Amazonian communities and others around the world have known that this honey can be quite medicinal. And so stingless bees in the Amazon play many roles. They play a key role in the culture. They are deeply associated with spiritual powers and communities that keep the bees Think of the bees not just as a pet that they're keeping or as a resource to improve their agricultural production, but instead they think of them as family. They live with them, although they're not in their house, but they're right in their backyard, which happens to be the Amazon jungle. So they are a deeply part of the daily conversation because they are considered family. They also play a key role in the economy because thanks to the keeping of stingless bees in the Amazon, people are able to collect and harvest their honey as well as their pollen and sell that in local markets, which allows for the communities to be able to build a sustainable circular economy in their areas without having to go to other activities that may be more detrimental to the environment, like cutting down trees. 
They also play a key role in traditional medicine. The honey that Stingle has been made are thought to be very quite powerful curatives. They have been reported, uh, communities have, have reported that they use the stingless bee honey to treat up to 14 different diseases, including gastrointestinal, skin conditions, upper respiratory infections, etc. They even report to have used it to treat COVID. They play a key role in the food and in the society as well. And with all of these, in partnership with local scientists, we are developing some of the first studies that are taking place in the Peruvian Amazon to try to decode what the science behind this Amazonian stingless bee honey is. What does the chemistry look like? What are the molecules that could be contributing to this medicinal power that communities claim this has? Could there be any type of contaminants that we find that we should let others know so that the quality can be better monitored? And we have found a few different things so far that we're currently in the process of publishing, which is we have found different plant-derived natural dyes and flavor molecules, which makes sense. The bees go to the different plants, flowers, and trees around it, feed on the nectar, and most likely are transporting those molecules back into the honey. Depending on the bee species that makes these medicinal honeys, the honey ends up adopting different colors. Perhaps in the supermarket, we are used to seeing a very thick type of dense, yellowish type of color honey. However, in the Amazon, we can find reddish, orangey type of tones, even kind of dark black tones of honey. And they all depend on the type of flowers and trees that surround the bee ecosystem at the time. So it's quite fascinating how flexible these bees are to really eat and adapt to what is around them. We have also found so far indications that there are molecules that are associated with some of the medicinal power that the communities uh, suggest that there are here, but more to that uh, as soon as we publish. So um, I, I cannot get too deep into that right now. Another interesting thing that we have found, which we do want to raise awareness on, are contaminants like pesticides. So we believe that when spraying pesticides in an area, people may think, oh, we are killing the plague. So on that side, it could be positive. However, I think there hasn't been that much implication or awareness on the fact that pollinators like bees come and feed on these plants that have the pesticides sprayed all over them. And so end up absorbing some of these pesticides quite literally into their bodies and then into the honey they make, but also impacting their own health. And so different countries around the world are starting to work a bit more actively on this because bees health in general, not just stingless ones, is decreasing around the world. People, agriculture, people in the US have reported that bees are living half the time that they should be living. And so that's really concerning when we go back to what I said at first, that two out of three foods depend on, on bees. And so we really need to bring that awareness back a little bit to go back to the field and study what's happening to understand and try to potentially find solutions to all of these issues. Something positive with all of this too is that our studies are showing us that by keeping stingless bees in the Amazon, we can incre increase agricultural production of native crops up to 44%, suggesting that they could be more effective pollinators than the stinging bee, which often people literally bring from outside into the Amazon to try to increase reforestation and production of agricultural crops. And why it kind of, it feels a bit, when, when I say it out loud, feels a bit like a contradiction. Why would people be bringing literally foreign bees from outside into the environment to help with this if there are stingless bees there? And however, this is happening in reality. And I think it's because there was a lack of knowledge on one, that there are stingless bees, and on two, that they are very effective pollinators. So this is the type of conversation we're trying to shift so that we can inform agricultural companies and institutions to be able to promote more local beekeeping. And the type of work, scientific and, and conservation work that we're doing, we're really pairing up from an artistic perspective so that we can, like the video that you saw at the beginning, so can we really can convey a strong message that is not just dependent on a scientific publication that we put out together, but also really through a visual perspective that allows people to immerse into the world and really connect with the key players that are behind all of this work. 
And something that we're also actively to work, uh, looking forward to work in this project is that we're partnering with different um, institutions within the Peruvian governments so we can take some legal action. We learned that there's no legal recognition or protection of stingless bees, which then puts them really as a threat to disappear. Deforestation is actively hitting them, as well as the constant reintroduction of foreign bees into the environment, stinging bees that tend to be more aggressive against the stingless bees that don't really have those type of mechanisms like a sting to defend themselves. And so that's on one project. And I'll just briefly touch on another one, and then I'll love to hear all your questions, which is on a project that it's also really close to my heart, an extremely fascinating extreme ecosystem that is also within the Peruvian Amazon, but not quite in the same area where the stingless bees um, that I was talking about are. And it's known as the Boiling River, a river that quite literally boils. Its traditional name is Shanay Timpishka, known as Boil with the Heat of the Sun. And in some spots of the river, temperatures have reached as high as 200 Fahrenheit. So extremely, extremely hot. You get immediately third degree burns if you just have your skin there for one second. So really no animal, no mammal can survive there at all. This place holds a strong and important cultural meaning to the communities around it, given that different type of gods or spirit-like um, meanings are associated to each natural um, space. So, for example, the water is associated uh, with a type of, you can call it God, the vapor as well, they're associated with strong medicinal powers. And so the community in this area, led by the maestro, Juan Flores, who is in this photo, have protected the, their natural ecosystem for a long time, which we're really appreciative of. Um, Andres Russo, another Nagy explorer that is fantastic, uh, a fantastic researcher and a dear friend, it's the one that has been studying the geological part of why this river even boils for a long time, and his work is going to be published soon, so look out for that. But he has written a really interesting, cool book that describes more on this river. If you were interested, you can find it online. It flows hot for nearly four miles. And what is even more unique about this river, why it's different to other Bolin rivers around the world, is that it's really far, over 400 miles away from the nearest volcano. So just to give you an example, the Yellowstone National Park, Yellowstone Bolin waters are extremely hot as well, also acidic. Um, but they are extremely associated with a volcano, and that happens with a lot of thermal hot springs around the world. There are a few only that are not associated with a volcano. And in this specific scenario, this Bolin River, it also happens to be placed in the heart of one of the most biodiverse regions of our planet. So a question that was left on people's minds was, nothing really can survive here, right? Is that true? And it was through our eyes of chemical biology that we wanted to continue expanding that question and looked at a at much more smaller level, at a micro level. And by being able to explore nature through this way, we realized that maybe mammals and animals cannot survive here, but other tinier microorganisms can. So as you see here, all of these green type of algae uh, which is a type of microorganism has come together in such large communities to the point that they go from being microscopic, invisible to the naked eye to now forming colors and shapes that we can see with our naked eye, being able to survive where there is quite literally boiling water. And so what that tells me as a scientist is that these microorganisms have a unique power. They have been able to evolve their DNA and their chemistry to be able to survive where nothing else can. And we know these type of microbes as extremophiles because they love the extremes. In this case, they love the heat. So the more specific term would be thermophiles. Um, it would be your equivalent of microorganisms that love to live in, for example, high pressure or extreme cold environments and et cetera, extremes. They love the extremes. And so we thought it would be really interesting to dive a little bit farther in this type of extremophiles in the Bolin River to be able to decode how can they survive? Could that inspire future studies 
on how to help plants thrive in hotter environments? Could we be learning perhaps about their chemistry in order to access new solutions for the planet, for bioremediation, climate environments that are polluted for, from oil, for example, or even being able to access new medicines? And so it is sponsored by a, a grant through National Geographic. We were able to put together a team of really fantastic researchers and artists to go and explore the river from a multidisciplinary perspective and collect samples from your hotter, hottest spots to some of the cooler ones, because it does eventually cool down, in order to explore what the microbial composition it is, what kind of microbes are here, what can they tell us, what can we learn about it? And we are really close to getting this work out there. So hopefully I can come back to talk to you guys when that is out there. But we are creating a website that is going to be free to access for everyone bilingual. So you can explore the river, the river with us, per se, and see the photos that we took at the macro level, the macroscopic level, as well as this microscopic level, and see some of the results that we have found along the way. This was an extremely interesting experience as an explorer because it is an extreme location. So we do have to be super aware about safety at all times. You take one wrong step and then you're not on a rock anymore. And that's something that we have to be always very mindful of, as well as making sure that the work that happens takes place without impacting negatively the environment. We're not leaving any residues behind that could be detrimental to the space where we work with. And that's something really important to always keep in mind when we are in nature, really anywhere. Um, something that I also really love about this project is the fact that it allowed me to show that anybody can really do adventure-driven science in a way. There was this one spot of the river that was known as the Spider-Man wall because it's kind of like a small cliff and you have extremely hot water below you. And in order to get to the other side, which was like kind of like a small little island, you needed to rock climb. You literally needed to grab one rock from one side like that to the other side, almost forming the shape of Spider-Man, which is how it got its name, and then carefully get yourself to the other side. But because it's so dangerous to get to do that, uh, very few people have been to the other side, which immediately told me that that means it's quite pristine with the minimum amount of contamination. So I became immediately scientifically interested in collecting samples from that space to be able to study them in the lab as well. But they had told me that no girl yet had done this. And so I thought, well, we need to change that. And I had basic rock climbing experience and two experts that were right next to me guiding me through the whole experience to make this as safe as possible, but also show that there shouldn't be any prejudices about who can do what in the field. And so I'll well, How do you feel right now? Um, not too bad, as long as I don't sleep. Sweet. You see the bubbling waters down there? Yeah, try not to see them. Okay, sorry. And so my mom was really mad that I did that, but everything was fine. We did it very safely and very cautiously, but it was just really exciting to be able to show that anybody can do that type of exploration as well. Um, we took those samples to the lab and we're getting ready to publish this work that we've been carrying out for the last three years in, in a larger team in collaboration with the University of Michigan, as well as with the Universidad Nacional Agraria in Peru. So with all of that, with the two stories I've told you so far, what I really would like to highlight is the fact that we can approach work through multiple lenses. In my case, I approach it through scientific research as well as through artistic storytelling in order to use these different tools to find effective conservation strategies that help the Amazonia, that help the more fragile environments and more fragile organisms within the Amazon rainforest that is already being threatened from so many 
factors, deforestation, illegal mining, contamination, and so on. And so we're really trying to put a positive change, a positive spin to all of these and being able to approach exploration from a slightly new perspective where it's not just deeply science or it's not just deeply art, but in, instead creating a dialogue and a conversation between scientists and artists so that everybody can be involved in the process of exploring and conserving a new space. Um, I'm always excited to connect with classrooms, as I say in the beginning, because I really think that's where we get a lot of the sparks, even if it's just one talk you see one day or one book you read one day. And so I encourage you to go and explore your own backyard, your own spaces. If you live in a city, any type of connection you can get to nature, even if it's in some of the birds, look at the smaller level as well, because that's where a lot of the magic can happen. Thank you so much for your attention. Here you can find me on social media. You can also reach to me directly by email if you have any specific questions and you can also invite you to check out my website. Thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, we had an experiment where we made a cloud in a jar. We didn't have many materials. We had the jar, we had some ice, some boiling water, and we had some hairspray. So let's take a look at the results of that experiment and let's figure out why it happened. I'm going to share a video file here and let's walk through it. Okay, here we go. So if you recall, we had our experiment. We poured some boiling water into a jar. So maybe a quarter to a half full. You don't need a lot of water. But you can see right away that water heats up. That warm water heats the air in the jar. Some of that water condenses immediately and becomes water vapor. Changes from a liquid to a gas. I put a little food dye in. You don't have to put the food coloring in, but I thought it made it look a little more interesting. You can see it spread really quickly in the warm um, water. Then I had my lid ready and the hairspray. I sprayed the hairspray in and quickly put the lid on top. And you can see that cloud that formed immediately inside. I put the ice on top because that cooled... Um, the air inside as it rose and allowed it to condense because going from a gas to a liquid, you need it to cool down now and to condense. Now, what did it condense around? When clouds form in the atmosphere, they can condense around uh, particles of dust and dirt and pollen, uh, pollution that we put into the air. So that's why we added the hairspray. Those particles of hairspray that we put inside allowed the water vapor, the gas, to condense around them uh, as it cooled uh, and form uh, some condensation. So that is what we had happening in our make a cloud experiment. We had the water vapor formed by the boiling water. We cooled it so it could condense around the hairspray particles, just like what is happening in the real world when uh, clouds are formed, when the warm air rises, the water vapor, it cools and condenses around uh, particles in our atmosphere. So here we go. I'm trying it one more time here just to see. Again, water vapor. It cools when it reaches the top where the ice is and it condenses around those hairspray molecules. That's why we get that cloud in the jar. I did mention we're gonna try this a couple more times. There's different ways you can do this, different variations, uh, all pretty cool looking. So over time, we will try this experiment a few more times in different ways, but there we go, making a cloud in a jar. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us for the World's Most Exciting Classroom. This was actually our 30th World's Most Exciting Classroom. By the time all is said and done in July, 2025, we'll have done over a hundred of these live connections for classrooms all over the world. We'll talk to amazing speakers all over the world, connected in amazing places from the ship in the field. Uh, tons of experiments, curiosities, prizes given out. Uh, yeah, the world's most exciting classroom is a busy place. Mm -hmm.